go. So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. We are going to start this afternoon session four on characterization in situ following exposure. My name is Stefan Lucas. I come from Namur in Belgium, from the University of Namur. And I'm the director of an institute for life science called Narilis, for which uh, Dr. Olivier Toussaint uh, is working. Uh, Olivier Toussaint was the head of the Nanotoxico project and now the Namur Nano Safety Center project. So I will leave the floor to my colleague, Peter Wick, for some housekeeping and for the presentation of the first keynote speaker. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Ping Jan, is director of the High Throughput Analytical Chemistry Facility and member of the faculty of the St. Jude Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, and at the same time he is heading a research group in the University of Changdong in China. And it's really a great pleasure to have you here, Bing, and please, the floor is yours. First, I want to thank the organizers of this conference to put together a really interesting conference. Also, I want to thank the uh, chairs of the session, especially Peter, for the invitation. So today I'm uh, going to talk about uh, the, what we have done in the past few years to understand, try to understand uh, how nanoparticles in interface with uh, cells, with uh, biological systems. So for this audience, I don't need a very long introduction. I'll just give you a very short uh, introduction on why we are interested in studying this. And then I'm going to talk about the nanoparticle cell interactions. And finally, um, how we can modify to control this kind of uh, in interaction. This way. So we all know nanotechnology is a very powerful. It's already impacted many industrial sectors. And you can, you can see from every industrial area, na nanomaterials uh, play an important role. Now also in medicine, health, and nanotechnology is supposed to really promising in this area also. Uh, for example, for cancer, we're looking at basically targeting specifically um, tumor and cells and uh, for imaging and the uh, treatment. And that's two very important uh, changes right now we can see. And, uh, and in, in, in one way, basically this meeting is very, in a very good timing because the production of nanoparticles really significantly increased and still increased because of the high profit in this area. You can see, I just uh, did a quick search. You can see, uh, you know, thousands of tons of nanoparticle is produced. And another alarming change is uh, consumer products. Uh, more than 1,300 uh, uh, consumer produ products are already on the market, already in our lives. Uh, so we basically we have uh, contact with these nanoparticles in our daily lives. So the, this nanoparticle can come to the body from uh, ingestion, inhalation, and uh, skin. And they can, from all this route, they can go to a third circulation and uh, go in different organs. So we, a few years ago, we studied it. We looked at the, the male reproductive systems. And, and by radio labeling carbon nanotubes, we found uh, uh, nanotubes in the testes. And although it's a small amount, but with time, it's, a, uh, it's a increasing with time. And so, this is a, a dissection of a testis. It shows the, the seminiferous tubules. And this uh, layer of uh, ger germinative layers is very important because the cell develops from outside to inside to become a, a sperm cells. And so this thickness is very important. We, 
After we gave five doses of carbon nanotubes in 15 days, and at day 15, you can see the layer of this uh, wall decrease. And this kind of damage, you know, we also detected the, the increase in the, in the ROS levels at 15 days. But all these changes, you know, we return to normal at day 60 after the exposure. And by looking at many, many uh, a images, and uh, we can give a statistic uh, um, figure here. You see, there's a significant, uh, there's a small decrease in 15 days, and uh, return to normal. And this kind of change and uh, did not affect the sperm, and also did, did not affect the re reproductivity of the, the mice. And by point out this, I want to see because all these damages in the organ in the animals all started from the cell. The other part we have to contact with cell and interfere with the cell signaling. So that will be my next topic. And a few years ago, we look at the how carbon, how carbon nanotubes and go into cells, and we found out that a lot of nanotubes in aggregate it will contact with the cell wall and endocytosis into cells. And also some uh, well dispersed carbon nanotubes can penetrate the cell walls, go into the cytoplasm. And when nanotube aggregate coming to the endosomes, it keep interacting with the membrane. If there's a protein receptor on the membrane, there will be still a continued interaction there. And it will, it, they will become loosely packed and pe penetrate the wall and go into the cytoplasm. Finally, you know, excreted and, you know, get out of cell. We know the cell surface is, a, is not smooth. It has a lot of biological molecules as a sensor, as a membrane re receptors. So we wonder if the contact of nanoparticles with the cell walls, uh, cell surface can cause any specific interaction and, and interfere the, the signaling in cells. So the multi-wall carbon nanotubes, uh, what they have is uh, uh, have a diameter of uh, 30 to 50 na 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 nanometers, and uh, that's a range of length. And the surface, the z potential in water is uh, minus 42, and uh, in serum proteins, because the binding of proteins is changed. And also, the, because it's uh, oxidized and uh, pu purified many, many times, the, the trace metal is very, very low. In uh, serum protein cell culture medium, and it's bound to protein, a lot of protein bound to this. So this, you know, this, uh, this is really a biological identity of nanoparticles. So from this figure, we can see the aggregated carbon nanotubes contact with the uh, uh, cell walls. And uh, I uh, hypothesize it may bind to the protein on, on the cell wall. Also, the dispersed the carbon nanotubes also bind to cell walls, maybe may binding to proteins. So we use the techniques called uh, a PLA, the proximity ligation assay. So this assay was used to detect the protein-protein binding. So if two proteins bind to each other, and they have an an antibodies on them, from antibodies you can put a DNA with a secondary antibodies. Then you, uh, you can li ligate this DNA and form a circular uh, DNA here. And this circular amplification can amplify this circular DNA, and the fluorescence die will die, you know, give, give fluorescence. So in cell, you will see a fluorescence dot. That shows these two proteins bind to each other. Well, we wonder if we can use this to see if the carbon nanotube really bind to a surface re receptor proteins. So this is, you will see if there's a two proteins binding to each other. So we figured that maybe we can put a, a, a protein on carbon nanotubes, then you know, use antibodies to detect carbon nanotube bind to a receptor protein. So in previous research, we found out a BMP re receptor 
is possibly involved in carbon nanotube binding. So in this work, we look at that we, for example, we use uh, antibodies for BMP1 and BMP2 to, to see if these two protein, two receptor protein, bind to each other. We know that uh, if we put the ligand BMP4, this protein will significantly bind to each other. So th th this you can see here. There's a lot of dots here. And if we incubate with carbon nanotubes, this binding decreased. And so, so supposedly, carbon nanotubes inhibited this binding. And this uh, noggin is a known in inhibitor. It uh, the binds to BMP4 ligand, so it inhibited the BMP1, BMP2 binding. So that's an indication that the carbon nanotube probably inhibited the BMP1, BMP2 receptor binding. So at the basal level, without the ligand, without BMP4 ligand, BMP1 receptor and BMP2 receptor also bind, but at the lower level. So here, no ligand, you can see the um, binding. You see uh, a lot of dots, the two receptors binding to each other. And we, we, here we look at the uh, carbon nanotube with BMP receptor 1. This is a little bit but much smaller, but if you see the carbon nanotube with BMP receptor 2, there's a more interaction, more binding. And also, there's a, if you, you look at the, uh, we put a, a non-specific protein on carbon nanotube, there's no, no antibodies you will not see this uh, binding with BMP receptor 2. And also, we don't see a uh, carbon nanotube binding to BMP4. There's no binding to a ligand. So this really tells us probably carbon nanotube binding to BMP receptor 2, and, but probably not, not, not specifically. And so how can it be specifically binding to one receptor? Probably binding to some other receptors, but we, we see uh, BMP2 re receptor binding to carbon nanotube. Because it's not specific, because if we do the DNA array, you can see that the more than 400 gene either down-regulated or up-regulated at a two-time point, and you see many uh, gene decrease, increase, increase, then become decreased. And, but we do see five genes at two-time point are all, always down-regulated at a two-time point. These two, five genes, uh, four of them are ID genes. ID is an inhibitor of differentiation or inhibitor of DNA binding gene. And that uh, is a target of BMP signaling pathway. So another way we tell this not specific binding to BMP receptor 2, you see is many, many signaling pathway affected um, by this uh, carbon nanotube binding. However, the BMP signaling is a significant part of this non-specific binding because uh, we see that uh, this signaling pathway affected at both time point. So this pathway is known, and it started with the ligand BMP4 binding to, to BMP receptor, then this uh, BMP receptor 1 and 2 dimerize, and then induce the phosphorylation of BMP receptor 1. And this phosphorylation uh, triggers the SMAD158 phosphorylation. And when it's phosphorylated, it's binded to SMAD4 and form a complex. This complex goes to nucleus and triggers the gene regulations. And this uh, ID1 is one of the target genes of this pathway. And from here, you, we, we look at, and we can see this. Uh, SMAD1 protein, not much changed with the carbon nanotubes, but the phosphorylated SMAD1 decreased when treated with carbon nanotubes. And also the ID protein uh, downregulated. And by the user GFP SMAD1 and, and tra transfected cell line, we can see the, the SMAD1 indicated by fluorescence in cells. When you add ligand, it goes go to nucleus. The fluorescence goes to nucleus. And if you use carbon nanotube treatment, and it's not much go, going to nucleus, uh, suggest uh, this signaling pathway was, was uh, suppressed. So at this uh, 2009, our understanding is, is 
the combinatorial tube effect uh, and this, uh, this uh, dimerization and uh, signal pathways. But uh, from now, because of data I just showed, we can say combinatorial tube uh, uh, bind to BMP receptor 2 uh, and inhibit the di dimerization and phosphorylation of uh, uh, BMP receptor 1. Then down regulated this signaling pathway and the ID gene, ID proteins. And there's a, a class of uh, proteins called uh, HLH family transcription factor proteins. And they are really many, many, this family ha have ma many members and uh, play a very important role. It's in different organisms all have this class of proteins. And also involved in many uh, important functions. ID1 is one of these uh, HLS uh, proteins. And the difference is that ID1 does not have this uh, DNA binding domain. So all these uh, HLS uh, transcription factor proteins have uh, a dimerization domain and DNA binding domain. It dimerize and binding to DNA and trigger the gene e expression. And however, ID1 does not have this domain. So when ID1 binds to one of these proteins, it will inhibit this uh, DNA transcription process. So that's why cell uses this uh, to re regulate this process. You know, sometimes they want more of this, sometimes they want, want less of that. So ID1 play an impor important role in this way. In the cell differentiation, also there's a, a HLH protein play a very important role, and so that's why we want to look at you know the downstream signaling transduction. In we use the cell line C2C12. This is the mouse uh, progenitor cells. At different conditions, it can be differentiated into the bone cells or to muscle cells. And in this cell line, we see that uh, if it's at the carbon nanotubes here, there's a phosphorylation of BMP receptor 1 is decreased. So because I showed you that carbon nanotubes probably bind to BMP receptor 2, and then after binding, it inhibits the BMP2 and BMP1 dimerization. So that inhibits the phosphorylation of the BMP receptor 1. And also, in this case, we also see the SMAD protein have not much changed, and the phosphorylated SMAD protein and decrease with carbon nanotubes. Same time, the ID protein also uh, decrease, suggesting in this cell line also carbon nanotubes suppress the BMP signaling pathways. So then we look at if uh, this downregulated ID1 have anything to do with the uh, HLH proteins. Uh, in that uh, transcription process, in the differentiation of the cell. So in this uh, cell line, there's a downstream that uh, protein HEB is a HLH protein, and a myOD also HLH protein. These two form a dimer, bind to a myogenin promoter region, as a region called the E-box. So this uh, to put in binding to this and trigger the expression of myogenin. So normally this is controlled by ID proteins. Mm -hmm. So you, if you don't want cell, don't want to, to, to differentiate, the, the ID will counteract this. So in this cell line, what we found after a treat with the carbon nanotubes, we see the myOD HEB at not much change, but we see the myogenin protein expression increase. So because these two uh, control the myogenin uh, protein expression. So we look at if whether this is happen, whether this uh, ID more bind to, uh, binding to HEB was decreased, and more HEB and MAUD binding uh, in this case. So here we did an IP study here. And so basically we use antibody of HEB pull down um, this uh, protein, HEB, also pull down any protein bind to this protein. So in this case, you see this uh, ID supposedly bind to this protein. After treated with, treated with the carbon nanotubes, it is decreased. Less, less ID bind to this protein. So this uh, regulation is uh, gone. 
Then we see the mild E binding to the HEB protein increase with the carbon nanotube treatment. So this is this consistent with the downregulation by BMP signal and pathway, downregulation of ID proteins. And basically, you lost this uh, control, and uh, you have more mild E bind to this, then more expression of myogenic my proteins. And to further confirm this, we want to find out if this, um, this complex really bind to this uh, DNA region. And uh, we, we did this cheap experiment. This is we, ex we put on antibody, also see the, the, the RNA um, to see if the myogenic expression uh, is increased. Is increased. So here you can see this part is uh, after pull down, you see the myogenic prom promoter increase with uh, the carbon nanotube concentration. So, so, so suggesting basically uh, down regulated ID protein, basically you recruit more HEB myoD complex onto this, uh, the E box region of the promoter. So myogenic is uh, the a, a initiator of the uh, muscle differentiation process. So in this study, basically we generate a cell line with the luciferase uh, genes uh, is driven by the, the, the myogenic gene. So in this case, myogenic promoter activity is uh, normally at the differentiation medium is at this level after treatment with the carbon nanotube is increased suggesting this, this is the, the expression of myogenic is, is increased, is controlled by the carbon nanotubes. Also, the myogenic expressed in the cytoplasm, when it's pressed, it has to go to nucleus to start the, this uh, the differentiation process. So we look at the nuclear translocation of the, the myogenic. So in this case, the differentiation medium is supposed to, uh, to have some of this process. You can have some nuclear translocation of myogenic proteins at different times. And the carbon nanotube certainly uh, increased this uh, nuclear translocation. The mouse in heavy chain protein is a marker of the ter terminal differentiation of the cells. And uh, here we look at it in the differentiation medium the cell will differentiate, so this uh, marker protein increase with time. And compared with the use of carbon nanotubes, you, you see this, uh, this marker significantly higher. And, and also after the differentiation, the, the formation of myotubes, the myotube is a kind of a long cell with a lot of new nucleus in, inside. So that's a, a fusion index is the a number of nucleus in the, in the mouth tube uh, versus the total number of nucleus. So you see this uh, fusion index increased by carbon nanotubes. So our current understanding is carbon nanotubes, this is a, a non-specific interaction, but have a pretty uh, large interaction with the BMP receptor two, And this interaction with the BMP receptor 2 uh, prevented the dimerization of, of the receptors and then the phosphorylation of BMP receptor 1 and uh, affected this uh, BMP signaling pathway and caused the downregulation of ID proteins. The downregulation of ID proteins actually uh, lost the control of this, uh, these uh, differentiation, the HLH uh, protein transcription factors. So this basically uh, caused the increase in myogenic proteins. And myogenic protein definitely uh, caused this, this de deflation, promoted deflation process. Of course, our, under our understanding is a very little bit in this uh, uh, real world in in interaction because the signal introduction is really very, very complex from network to network. And our understanding is really very small part of this. And a final topic I want, because we have been thinking about how we can regulate uh, any biological effect of, of nanoparticles. And you know, the, from literature, biological effect of nanoparticles can be controlled by, by the structure, by shape, by size, 
And here, um, what we are interested in the surface chemistry. A few years ago, we tried uh, to use uh, the technology in drug discovery called combinatorial chemistry to make a carbon nanotube combinatorial chemistry library. The idea is that uh, we have a, a linker on carbon nanotubes, and which have two sides can do the, do the re re reactions. And then we can, we can choose the reagent on these two, two sides. And how to choose this? You know, we use a computational method. Basically, uh, we have many, many this kind of more molecules that we calculate to, to select a very diverse more molecules with diverse properties. Um, then we, we make the, all the combination of these two, two, two reagents to make a, a combinatorial uh, carbon nanotube library. Then we want to see does this really change the biological effect of carbon nanotubes. This is the, just one data, so the protein binding, we also did, did the, the, the cytotoxicity. We see the, basically this modification really changed the, the biological interactions of the, these nanoparticles and with, uh, with cells, with proteins. And also, we using macrophage, we, we studied the immune reactions and for NO gen generations, and we see there's a diverse of, uh, effect on, on this uh, macrophage. And in this study, basically, we also picked the, the most uh, toxic one and the less toxic one, and we want to look to study why this happened. So these two nanoparticles we pick, and we basically, in this study, we inject the radio-labeled carbon nanotube in mice. We see the, 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 the distribution of this kind of carbon nanotubes, mostly in lung, in liver, and spleen. So we look at these, these three organs, and what we found out is that the carbon nanotube one is a toxic one. There's an immune uh, re response is pretty high, and, but the carbon nanotube two really reduce the, the response almost in the vehicle level. This is in vivo. Then we look at the microphage to see uh, what happened. And you can see the indicators such as NO for carbon nanotube 2 that's a reduced PNF alpha, uh, significantly re reduced. And look at the uh, uh, ROS generation reduced in carbon nanotube 2. Also, the mitochondrial membrane potential decreased. At least in, so in cell and in vivo, in vitro, we, do, we both see this uh, change in the decrease in the in, in immune toxicity. So we wonder, maybe they, they go into cell in a different way, or they have different amount of cell uptakes. So here we compare the the locations of the nanoparticle in cells, we found that they both pretty much the same. It goes to the same locations, and we use, uh, because the carbon nanotube absorbs protein tightly, we use a fluorescence label protein to absorb the nanotube, then we wash, then we see the, we study the uptake to, to monitor fluorescence. So from an uptake study, you can see the amount of uptake in, by these two nanotubes are almost identical, almost the same. And there must be some kind of specific chemical interactions, you know, from the common nanotube surface ligand with the cell memory proteins may be cause the difference. So we use several inhibitors to inhibit the macrophage re receptors. And what we found out is the, the scavenger receptor binding of the, the common nanotube 2 is much, much more than common nanotube 1. And carbon nanotube one has a little more mannose receptor binding. So mannose receptor binding is uh, activated the uh, NF kappa B pathways. And also we know the, the nuclear translocation of P protein P65 and the induction of INOS proteins and are the indicators of the NF kappa B activation. And both of these proteins were really uh, reduced a little bit by common nanotube 2. And scavenger receptor binding also um, 
activate this uh, circ family of uh, PTK protein, phosphotyrosin kinase proteins. And we can, you can see the carbon nanotube 2 uh, increased uh, this, this protein expression. And so that's the difference we, we found. And we basically, our understanding is probably this uh, carbon nanotube 2 really uh, altered this uh, interaction with the membrane receptor proteins and cause the most damage receptor binding, which actually uh, is good for, for the both in vitro and in vivo. Uh, so for this differentiation part, basically we, we generate a cell line with, uh, with the luciferase genes driven by the, by the ID genes. So we see if the, uh, this library, one screen, the whole library, uh, has a lot of carbon nanotubes. So if that affects the ID expression, so from that uh, selection and screening, we found that these carbon nanotubes. These can tune the ID gene at a d different level. So we want to see if we can tune the differentiation at different level. Uh, so basically, th this is what process we found out. Now we want to use different carbon nanotubes with different in interactions at this step, uh, which control the, the, this process at di different level. So what you can see is the uh, ID1 genes express the, the activation is tuned by this, uh, these uh, seven common nanotubes. And uh, at the same time, the myogenin gene also, my myogenin proteins and, uh, and tuned by this. And you can see also the the phosphorylation of BMP receptor 1 is controlled at a different level. And the phosphorylation of SMAD158 and ID protein. Finally, the myogenic protein and the mouse, the mouse in high, heavy chain protein marker. And also the differentiation of the cell is con controlled by, the, by this process. Uh, the fusion index is numbered here. So far, I talked about uh, only carbon nanotubes. I want to go to another nanoparticles, golden nanoparticles. So in this uh, research for, for, for some other purpose, we try, we want to understand, because this is a ligand on the, on the nano, golden nanoparticle. It binds to a cell surface receptor proteins. We want to find out uh, if we put another ligand here that can either pull, pull this together tightly and to increase the binding affinity, or it can, can be repel from this to interfere with this binding. So you want to see the dual ligand, the second ligand effect. This has uh, many useful things. For example, you can target the cancer cell. You can increase the targeting. Also, in some cases, you, you want to prevent the binding. And also, we use the combinatorial library approach on golden nanoparticles. Here, basically, we the first ligand is a folic acid. We want that a known ligand binding to cells, so that is fixed. The second ligand has a diverse changes in its uh, uh, synthesis of the second ligand. So the second ligand to first ligand is a 10 to 1 ratio. So basically, the first ligand is uh, surrounded by the second ligand. But this is a library case. We screen this library in several cells, and all these three cells all have folic re receptors. So they're all supposed to bind to these nanoparticles. And however, the other receptor may not be the same because the profile of surface membrane is, uh, is not the same. So first of all, we can see we can differentiate these cells from this study. They all, even though they all have a full fully receptor uh, binding to the cell, but the other part, you know, the, the profile is not the same. Another thing is that in many cases, we see the significant increase in the uh, binding. Uh, at least four times uh, increased binding. But in other cases, that's uh, even lower than one because the fully receptor, single receptor binding is one. So in other cases, it's uh, re reduced binding. Here, basically, we can show that by chemistry modification on surface, like, we can control uh, nanoparticle interaction with cells. And in order to show, really, this is the case, this uh, dual binding, this uh, multivalent binding caused this effect. Basically, we 
uh, did another experiment. We here you see this uh, uh, dual ligand binding, this dual ligand nanoparticles. This will be a single ligand one, single ligand two, and dual ligand increase the binding and you see two cell lines. And in this uh, third cell line, basically you also see it's one ligand, there's another ligand, there's two ligand, increase the binding. Then we use the free ligand, free ligand added to the cell culture medium. We add one ligand, you can see that there's a decrease in inhibition and computation of the binding site, de decrease the binding. And add another ligand, also decrease binding. And we add both ligand to compete the binding site, you can see decrease the, the dual ligand uh, nanoparticle binding to cells. So my summary is that basically nanomaterials, especially carbon nanotubes, uh, which I showed you a lot of data on that, and can cause an um, effect in vivo. And their biological effect at toxicity really is the result of the binding of carbon nanotubes to cells, uptake of cells uh, binding to receptor proteins and uh, uh, perturbing the signaling transactions. And also, just, uh, for just the modified surface chemistry and is possible, quite possible, we can regulate and control this biological activity and of uh, nanoparticles. And I acknowledge the, the my lab in Shandong University also I, I acknowledge the major contributors during the presentation. Uh, the funding of research, uh, uh, a few part by Ministry of Science and Technology of uh, China, National uh, Natural Science Foundation of China, National Cancer Institute of the U.S. and the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bing, for this firework of carbon nanotube cell-cell signal interaction. I'm pretty sure there are questions. University. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, presentation. I was uh, worrying the interaction of the particle that you were uh, using. Uh, is it uh, a receptor spe specific or non specific? The question of specificity is of a major issue. Yes, I, I think I mentioned that's not a specific interaction because a lot of genes, proteins, the signaling pathways were affected. So if we see nanofuel bind to a surface, a lot of receptors may, may be affected. Uh, but here we only look at the BNP signaling pathway. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Patrice Pach from Grenoble in France. Uh, you demonstrated that uh, carbon nanotubes um, inhibit ROS production. Do you have an idea uh, of which pathway is, uh, of ROS production is, in, uh, is involved? Uh, which pathway involved in ROS? Yes. We, we did not look at it, we don't know. Okay, well, what do you think? Mitochondria or NADPH oxidase? Could be mitochondria, that's, uh, because uh, mitochondria membrane pro potential decrease. And by the way, we did not uh, look carefully. Uh, okay, were well, you able to localize the uh, ROS in, uh, in, in the cells? Localize? Yeah. No. We, no, we did not look at it. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting point. Further question? By Wiki, please. Uh, thank you for a really beautiful study and presentation today. Um, I wondered if you could just tell us a bit more about how you came to choose all the different modifications of the multi-wall carbon nanotubes. So what were your justification between each of those? And then a little bit more detail about multiple carbon and nanotube one and two, because although you showed it very quickly, I guess most people didn't really catch what those modifications mm -hmm. were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, 
uh, in the beginning, it's pretty difficult to, to, to choose how to modify. And so that in the two libraries, Carbon Nanotube and Gold Nanoparticle libraries, we, we take an easy way, basically we made, made a diversity library. And so by diversity, I mean ligand, we do the com computation, find out uh, mo most the different uh, in terms of uh, hydrophobicity, hydrogen binding, PKA, solubility, uh, based on calculations. Then we choose these compounds to do to the synthesis. Um, so maybe in future, we will focus on certain properties uh, and to, to make a library. And I forgot your second question. Is, uh, Oh, that based on the screening the whole library, we found out one basically we pick one is the most toxic and one less toxic. And we picked the two nanotubes and did the study and tried to find out why why this happened. Yeah. The the yeah the structure is showed here, but uh, we did not figure out why this modification caused. Uh, So these are mod modifications, and uh, one is a, is a, basically the, the precursor of this library, the car carboxylate common nanotube is showed um, most toxic, and after adding a, a small molecule on, on it is uh, reduced. And why this, uh, we, we, we don't know, we don't know how is the interaction with the protein receptor, and we don't know. Next question, please. Thank you for a fascinating presentation, Bing. Um, I was wondering, you showed elements of the inflammasome. Did you look into the whole cascade of inflammasome activation? Which one? Can, can you repeat? Can, can you repeat the question? Um, you were showing elements of the inflammasome, and I was wondering whether you were investigating the whole cascade of oh, okay. inflammasome activation leading to IL-1 beta production? Uh, no, no, that's a good suggestion. And we, I think we did a very, very simple study here. And we, we should maybe in future go to detail. Thank you. So there's time for one last mm. question. Please, the person in back, maybe. <coughs> Uh, I just a, a comment more than anything else. The, the, I think it's infor, it, very important that people don't take a generic message away about carbon nanotubes. Even in unprocessed carbon nanotubes, there are many, many different types of nanotubes, even from physical properties, size, length, conduction, chirality, etc. The nanotubes that you're using are very heavily processed. They are presumed that they're acid processed, which reduce the size very much. Sure. They introduce a lot of surface defects, and a lot of those surface defects are then substituted by, and carboxylated in, in the simple case, and then you've added other things. So I just want to comment that, that you know, I, I don't want to sound like I'm defending nan nanotubes, I hate them, sure. um, but it's, it's very hard to take away generic messages about what nanotubes do. Sure. So this study only for, for this, this carbon nanotubes <laughs> in our lab. So. Those questions over, over there. So we have time for the last, the real last question, please. You, you showed several slides where um, you showed the dependence of an effect on the concentration of your uh, CNT suspension, like 50 milligrams per milliliter and, and so on and so forth. Microgram. Or micrograms mm. per, yes, indeed, <laughs> micrograms <laughs> per milliliter. Um, do you? When you use these different concentrations, do you see a change in the concentration, for example, of CNTs in the nucleus also? Because if you, if you have, uh, some of your effects are clearly induced by effects within the nucleus, but do you also see, if you, if you check the number of CNGs you can visually find, do you see changes there as well when you change the concentration on the outside? You mean change the concentration due to aggregation? You're changing the concentration of a suspension, right? 
Outside yeah, which means that yeah, we are okay. we are very careful when we, especially using higher concentrations, we will centrifuge down and centrifuge down the aggregated nanoparticles, and uh, measure. We have a UV <coughs> method to measure the concentration of carbon nanotubes. But do you then see a difference, let's say, in the number of CNTs which you find? We find a levels? number. I think that there should be no aggregate, no loss due to ag aggregation. Some type of nanoparticle, if you use high concentration, it becomes some, some aggregate that you drop down, and the effective concentration is lower. Is that what, what you're asking? No, no, I'm not asking. I'm asking if you change the concentration right. in the suspension, do you right. see a change in the concentration of CNT is a, a tubes that have actually entered into the nucleus? Nucleus? Yeah. Because you, and in one of your very early slides, yeah, yeah, nucleus is and, another and story. You it's want a, to have them in the nucleus if you it's want a, to have them we found, So far, we found only one carbon nanotube in the nucleus. It's not very easy to go into nucleus, but uh, right. we see it's possible to go to nucleus. But we didn't see a lot. Okay, thanks a lot for this lively discussion. I would like to thank Bing again for his presentation. We have some gifts for you. <laughs>